Hi, I'm Peter Rao, and welcome back to Counterbalance. This week, we're joined by Tom Dusterberg. Tom is a colleague of ours here at Hudson Institute, a senior fellow. He is an alumnus of the George H.W. Bush administration, where he served as Assistant Secretary of Commerce. He also served as Chief of Staff to Senator Quayle when he was not yet Vice President in the U.S. Senate. And he's had many other important postings with places like the Aspen Institute. We're thrilled he's uh, with Hudson and serves as, uh, I would say, our chief political economist, if I can put it that way. Tom's got a new report out, which we'll be talking about today. And uh, we'll hope you'll get a chance to read it over the holidays. With that, Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. We'll be taking a brief break over the holidays, but we'll be back in the new year. So welcome to Counterbalance and look forward to hearing Tom. All right, Tom Dusterberg, welcome to Counterbalance. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you, and uh, the occasion for why we're having you here today, despite your insights on many issues, is a report you recently published through Hudson. You can find it on the Hudson website. For those of you watching this, I'm holding it up now. China's economic weakness and challenge to the Bretton Woods system. How should the U.S. respond? For those of you who are listening to this without the video, you can pull this up at Hudson.org. I suppose that applies to the people watching at home as well, and um, I'd urge you to Read this report. Of course, this town is full of reports on China, its economic malaise or economic opportunity, however one sees it. What um, compelled you to write this report in the first place, Tom? How is this different than the other material literature that's out there? Well, it's uh, it's true, and it's interesting that um, people have been talking about uh, the Chinese economy for a while, but the uh, the the narrative has switched in recent years. Um, people have come more to uh, understand that the uh, the, the Chinese uh, sort of uh, triumphalist narrative of the ever-growing economy that's going to overcome the, that of the United States, there are more and more analysts who are questioning that. So um, that's one of the motivations for uh, me taking on this task again um, is to uh, dive more deeply into this. And in contrast to a lot of the analysts, I, I think that the Chinese economy is a lot weaker and possibly on the verge of some real problems. And so that it, it differs in that way in, in the sense that um, I'm more pessimistic about China's ability to address the uh, slowdown in their economy. Now um, – one of the uh, consequences of that, this slowdown is that China is unable, I think, to address some uh, longer-term structural problems that are also fairly well known but are generally ignored when people talk about the Chinese economy. I mean they have a demographic problem. They have government finance problems. They have – incredible environmental problems. They can't, uh, they're dependent on uh, outside sources for food and um, they have incredible water problems. Uh, the aging problem means that um, uh, people are not, uh, have to save to take care of their elderly parents. So they're not able to address these problems because of the, uh, of the financial uh, and general economic weakness. And the second thing I would say is that most analysts, um, while recognizing the weaknesses in China, don't take the next step and say, if we really want to have an impact on China, deterrence on Taiwan, for instance, or simply to uh, try to incentivize them to um, st stop the sort of economic activity which is in many ways undermining uh, the, both the rules-based system, the Bretton Woods system, uh, to abstract a little bit, uh, but also weakening the, in, in certain respects, the U.S. economy. They overproduce goods, manufactured goods of one sort or another, and they uh, displace Western manufacturers, not only the United States, but increasingly the Europeans, the Japanese, the, the, the Koreans. So uh, the final thing I would say is that um, I, I do propose a number of uh, actions that we can take that take advantage of these weaknesses, and some of them I think are a little bit more aggressive than, than most analysts would, uh, would uh, venture, um, things like capital controls, 
uh, outward bound investment controls, uh, possible uh, sanctions on commercial aviation sector, um, sanctions on banks, things like that, I think are a little more aggressive than, than most analysts have undertaken. That's interesting to, to hear in particular how you think some of our economic steps and measures can shape China's uh, global ambitions or perhaps not temper their ambitions, but at least, but at least constrain their behavior or their bad behavior. Um, but we'll get to all that in a minute. I, I was struck reading the reports. There are a few really, um, these aren't even necessarily connected, but few really sort of startling statistics um, that you noted that I just wanted to raise for our, our listeners and viewers. One is, and this is rather stunning, while about 15% of the U.S. population, you wrote, Tom, so over 50 million people is comprised of immigrants, and in Canada, the number is even higher at 21%. In Germany, it's at 18.8%. The number for China is slightly over 1 million people, or barely 0.1%. You've already raised the water number. That also really struck me. Data for 2018, you revealed, showed that water management authorities graded some 86% of the water in available in China at levels four or five, and level five is unusable for any purposes. And then this um, still struck me despite recognizing China's, uh, China's contribution to, um, to, to, um, to um, well, bad weather, climate change, however wants to put it. China is now the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, accounting for more of the world's total emissions than the U.S., the EU, and Japan combined. So really the sheer scale and, and extent of some of these statistics are probably a little bit more shocking than even – I think Washington, as it's come to grips with the rising China, has come um, to recognize. But let me let me therefore just start um, start in, uh, and those were just teasers to get viewers and listeners to maybe read the whole report. Um, you also noted that uh, something like 70-80% of family wealth has been held in real estate. You point out in the report there's been a real real estate bubble and, and a problem in real estate. So how are Chinese trying to deal with this problem they have that so much money is wrapped up in real estate? But it seems to be going south, or there's a real estate bubble that's been that's been pricked, or that's beginning to burst. What's the state of that? How should we think about that? Well, How are you watching it? Yeah, it, it, it the real estate problem continues to to get worse uh, and worse as time goes on, um, <clears throat> and it's uh, the real estate problem contributes in a number of ways to sort of macroeconomic weaknesses, uh, if, if I can dwell on that for just a second. Um, first, in terms of personal wealth, um, people had uh, – the Chinese uh, have put a lot of their their household wealth in, in real estate. Prices are going down. Sales are way off. Uh, so the value of their in investments and their accumulated wealth uh, continues to decline. And that's a problem, amongst other things, uh, for uh, making up for the lack of social services in, in China. They, they have underdeveloped medical care systems, their education system. They uh, oftentimes have to use private tutors to uh, enter, get their kids into competitive universities, got to pay for their, parent, their elderly parents. Their ability to do that um, is uh, completely undermined. So uh, the result is um, uh, that uh, Chinese uh, um, precautionary savings are very high. Only – the high 30s um, as a percentage of GDP goes into consumption, and that compares in the United States is something like 70 percent. Even Japan is like 60 percent. So China is not able to um, rely on its consumers to uh, advance its economy. But a lot of production, little consumption probably leads to dumping a lot of goods onto the world market. Uh, ex exactly. That's the, that's the other major um, um uh, problem and because uh, China has, <laughs> in the last ten twelve years, uh, nearly quadrupled its its uh, its uh, uh, national debt. I mean that and that debt is spread out between the federal government, the local governments, and the private sector. But especially the government finances are are, are really weak, so they are unable to do the sort of stimulus 
like we did in uh, the post-COVID environment. We spent, I don't know how many trillions here in the United States to uh, revitalize growth in our economy. Uh, with some good results, some bad results, but uh, China's just un unable to do that. And so what they would do in the past would be to open up credit, for instance, to the real estate sector uh, to revitalize growth or to uh, build new <laughs> airports and bridges and roads uh, as a means to stimulate growth. They're just unable to do that anymore. And um, on the uh, real estate sector in particular, how are how are how how are they coping? I mean, how are these every once in a while sort of fantastical headlines in places like the New York Times about? major real estate companies working the way towards default? Is there going to be a rescue? How do you think Xi and the Chinese leadership thinks about this sector? Well, they, 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 they would like to stabilize it and they would like to uh, decrease their reliance on, on that sector for uh, going forward. But um, um, because of the poor state of um, government finances and personal finances and banking, the banking system is uh, not very profitable in China. Um, so the traditional way they, they tried to deal with uh, real estate uh, uh, problems in the past was to lower interest rates, to lower the um, uh, required down payments. But now with uh, the, the sector in, in, in real decline, prices in decline, new, new, new developments in decline, um, they don't have a real, really good way to, to, to address that. And so they're basically trying to kick the can down the road and hope that uh, macroeconomic growth will finally enable them to uh, get out of this. But for our, you know, our viewers here in the United States and in the West, it, it's also notable they are starting to default a lot. The real estate developers are on their, their credit and the first defaults are always in bonds that they sell uh, denominated in dollars or euros. So um, they can extend the loans uh, that are denominated in renminbi, the Chinese currency, but they're starting to, to uh, disadvantage uh, Western investors uh, that had ventured into uh, Chinese real estate. I think that's a real problem for us, for our financial sector, um, for our banks, uh, for our investment funds that uh, go into China. And are heavily exposed to China? Not that heavily exposed. I mean, as a percent of, of all investments, but um, – you know, when um, five percent of your assets go bad, you know that that's a problem for a, for a bank. That's an, a problem for a bond fund. So uh, it hurts, and um, uh, you know it doesn't. I mean, it help hurts China in the sense that one of the ways they're trying to work their way out of the current uh, financial problems is to rely more on Western investments uh, into China, you know, through um, selling stock, selling bonds, but they're hurting themselves. They're, they're uh, shooting themselves in the foot by defaulting on the, all this Western denominated uh, loans. And presumably the, the political decisions of co to consolidate power under President Xi cuts against the sort of investment environment that would attract Western monies. So if there are raids being taken on uh, accounting firms or Moody is just telling its employees to work from home because a credit rating cut is about to take place and they are worried about a raid, all of that has to, in addition to first hitting your your, your, your foreign uh, investors and, and default, all of that has to deter some of this investment, no? Yeah, it sure does. Um, and we're seeing that. Uh, we are. Um, for the first time in decades, uh, Western money is on a net basis being pulled out of China. Um, in the first nine months of this year, there was a net, uh, net outflow of uh, Western, Western money. Um, I, I noted uh, in, in recent weeks, the um, 
Accounting Oversight Board and the SEC have both fined uh, Chinese accounting firms and American accounting firms that are operating in China because they just can't they're uh, they're not able to or they're not uh, allowed to give uh, accurate financial uh, statements like Western investors need and the Securities and Exchange Commission requires. So that is a deterrent <laughs> to to Western investment. Let, let me, if I may, just you you surface the the issue of Xi Jinping cracking down on many parts of the economy, on high-tech sectors. Um, he's uh, got this incredible um, uh, anti-corruption drive, which is <laughs> uh, sweeping up many uh, bank executives, real estate executives. Um, he's squeezing private companies. He's squeezing foreign companies. All of that is a deterrence to further investment in China to finally get around to asking the <laughs> Yeah, answering that's, your question. Also, you know, if you you mentioned earlier, if their real estate sector is <clears throat> the uh, the part of the Chinese economy that's really sort of the uh, the first indicator of of rot or of problem or of malaise, and the Chinese strategy is to grow its way out of this, so to produce enough growth rates to to re- re- essentially overcome some of the bad investments. How's that going? I mean, your report suggests that that even the official numbers aren't great, and who's to say how good those numbers are? What parts of the economy, if they are hurting some of the most innovative sectors, are they going to lean on to get the growth rates to overcome some of these problems? And for example, real estate. Well, real estate is not going to not going to be the way out for them. They're they're not going to be able to re, to revive that. Um, it's in too bad a shape. Um, they are not going to be able to to rely on um, infrastructure investment because they're basically over-invested. I mean, there are a lot of good roads and good railroads and good airports in China, heavily underused. So uh, manufacturing, <laughs> the traditional manufacturing sector, plus the uh, – let's, let's call it the green manufacturing sector – uh, China has done the usual thing that it does, which is overproduce, um, subsidize, and gr- grow into Western markets, export markets. So they did that in steel earlier. They did it in high-speed rail. Now uh, the China is very competitive in solar technology and in electric vehicle technology, battery technology. So that's the cutting edge, I think, going forward of um, sort of the tensions that are we're going to have with China because... Europeans too. Oh, the Europeans in a big way. I mean, the European auto sector, as you know as well as I, is in grave danger of being uh, undermined by EVs coming in from, uh, from China. It's already 15% of the European auto market. And the Europeans have discovered uh, how bad uh, trade deficits are. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen just traveled to to Beijing along with Charles Michel, of course, the commission and council president, and they raised this issue with the Chinese. Uh, all the reports from those meetings were that the Chinese uh, essentially wanted to paper over differences and you know keep the export markets available to themselves. So um, interesting to see, though, how both in Washington and in Brussels those tensions are rising in a real way. Yeah, and hopefully, um, hopefully we can work more constructively with our European counterparts to push back against Chinese overproduction subsidization. Uh, you mentioned von der Leyen; she um, uh, self-initiated a anti-dumping case uh, uh, against Chinese electric vehicles, and I'm morally certain the United States will join that case, but. That's where we're headed, I think, in, in the trade field at least is uh, probably some, some real tensions over uh, green technology. So um, that brings us to what you said in your opening, which is that we can use economic levers to potentially shape political decisions. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, just 
Um, I mean, China entered the WTO, what, uh, 20-some years ago, and they uh, pledged to follow the, the, the rules of the World Trade Organization. And the simplest of these is uh, reciprocal treatment. Uh, also, uh, limits on subsidization, severe limits on subsidization is another benchmark uh, uh, value of the World Trade Organization. And China has systematically undermined both of those. So given the, um, the practice that we have developed and the traditions we have developed to um, try to uh, eliminate subsidies, uh, eliminate unfair treatment, uh, a a asymmetric treatment, one sort or another. I think that gives us an um, enormous uh, amount of um, scope to push back on China. Tariffs, any dumping cases, um, but also um, Chinese um, limit um, uh, participation in their economy, investment in their economy. And the financial sector was sort of the poster child of that. They were supposed to open their financial sector to Western banks, to uh, Western payments, credit card systems and the like 20-some years ago. Well, they finally got around to doing it to a certain extent in the last two years. So this idea of reciprocity, again, um, uh, was was totally uh, totally trashed by by the Chinese. So I think we can we can push back on their their banks, their their, um, their credit. I mean, Alibaba, Alipay is everywhere in the United States, right? Why don't we sanction? Why don't we kick them out the way they kicked our credit card companies out and are still kicked out? Uh, same applies to uh, online retailers. I mean, Amazon tried to get into the Chinese market. They had uh, 15 years ago, they had something like 15% of the Chinese uh, um, online sales market. They're down below 1% now. And they've essentially given up on that market because it's, they make it difficult for them to, to operate for the variety of techniques. Meanwhile, uh, Temu and um, Xi'an and uh, now it looks like TikTok wants to get into that uh, market of online sales. Why should we let them do that? Because our companies can't operate in China. Yeah, it seems like a sort of a Chinese biased system in a lot of ways. The Chinese continue to water cannon Filipino ships that are near the second Thomas Shoal or the Scarborough Shoal. At the same time, we, we uh, or even before that, which makes it even more worse, we roll out the red carpet for President Xi in San Francisco. And um, uh, it seems like from Xi's point of view, that was just to ensure that his own economic pain doesn't go too low, that the ceiling doesn't drop out altogether, or the, the basement doesn't drop out altogether. But they're just as aggressive as ever. They'll welcome investment in certain sectors that power their economy, but in others, they just shut it down as they wish. And we don't seem to have an answer for that. Well, it was quite amazing. I, I think in uh, that San Francisco meeting where she only accepted the invitation to come to San Francisco if he could uh, assemble a group of American business tycoons and leaders. And so they had this dinner uh, where the you know some of the biggest uh, companies in America were were represented, um, and she gave a speech which uh, he tried to lower the tensions and say we can be friends. He didn't give any ground on any part of the Chinese Substance, yeah. uh, the substantive problems that we have accessing their market. I uh, didn't really mention trade at all uh, and how we can improve the, the trade relations. Um, and I think that's an indicator that um, that whole summit was just for, for the Chinese window dressing, lowering the tensions, trying to make sure that, as, as you said, the bottom doesn't drop out of the, uh, the relationship, i.e. the markets for Chinese goods. 
uh, and services, increasingly services. So um, we have some – we didn't solve any problems in that San Francisco meeting. Let's move to some of the alternative global architecture that the Chinese um, seem to be attempting to assemble, at least. At the end of your report, uh, you mentioned this alternative clearing system that the Chinese have established. I don't know how to pronounce it, CIPS or KIPS or however one says it. Tell us about that. How successful has it been? Uh, what is it? What's the existing system look like? Well, um, the, uh, the dollar... Um, in the euro, for that matter, and to the, the pound, um, dominate uh, international transactions in terms of investments, um, trade finance, just paying for goods. 60% of global transactions are conducted in, in, in dollars. Um, the Chinese have noticed, um, I mean, they, they want to be a comparable power. Um, and the, the, the dollar's dominance is um, basically uh, operationalized through, you know, holding of uh, foreign reserves and use as a, the, 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 the transaction um, uh, uh, mechanism of choice, both in terms of the technology of actually just doing transferring money between banks, but also denominating the, uh, the, the trade. So the Chinese noticed that um, the United States uh, has uh, uh, utilized that uh, dominance to um, put sanctions in place against um, illicit uh, behavior of one sort or another, sanctioned behavior. Starting with North Korea, uh, Iran, uh, lesser extent uh, Venezuela, and now Russia. So China's always wanted to get out from underneath that, that system, but also to assert, assert its own dominance through increased use of its own currency and its own uh, payments systems. Uh, so they, they do have an alternative um, – payment systems, which you correctly identified in CIPS, um, and a communications technology, which just basically is, uh, uh, is the, the uh, grease that um, uh, enables transactions to take place. So um, after this has been in place for 10 years plus, uh, but it's been totally um, underutilized and unsuccessful so far. Only uh, about two to two to three percent of global transactions are done through this mechanism, and also um, why is that? Uh, there's no confidence uh, that holding uh, Chinese currency is a stable uh, situation because. Uh, Chinese uh, control the um, the value of the currency. It's been depreciating lately, but more importantly, it's it's not convertible. If you hold uh, RNB in China or wherever it is, you can't automatically uh, convert it into uh, dollars. So that's an incredible uh, because they impact. want to maintain control of the currency. Right. If they made it totally convertible. Uh, money would be uh, fleeing out of China at incredible rates because uh, of the many problems in China and because the crackdowns that she has uh, Im imposed on the business community, on rich individuals. So it's not going to be a convertible currency, and that's an incredible impediment to uh, internationalizing it. But also there are technical problems in their communication systems, uh, which uh, are not fully explained. It may have to do with the use of the Chinese script and Chinese language. But um, that just uh, seems like an engineering problem to me more than the former, which is really a systemic it, one. Yeah, it, it does. But it's 80% uh, of the transactions, the global transactions in the Chinese currency have to be signaled through communications using the Americans – or the dollar-denominated system, which is called the SWIFT system. Right. So um, what then, given your uh, what I hear to be skepticism about China's ability to 
craft the reserve currency, do you think is the motive between, and there's a section in your report on this as well, the attempt to expand BRICS to build out a larger a coalition of countries? Do you think this is building a latent economic alternative, which at some point, if the Americans and the Europeans are at loggerheads, it will allow them to make a play for an alternative currency? Do you think it's just a kind of a, the attempt to slowly but surely build up a trading zone? What is what is BRICS to you? It, yeah, I, in the I political th- economy. I, I, I think part of the idea is to uh, an alternative zone of economic activity, and they would like for it to be uh, done in local con- currencies again because they they want to avoid the possibility of sanctions, but. Um, you know the, the the basic idea that uh, that Xi Jinping and the PRC has for China is to be self-sufficient in every possible way. I mean, not not just in uh, food, but in um, uh, the control of their economy. So, it, the more they can do business with um, like-minded countries and build. Uh, their own trading um, uh, agreements. Uh, the Chinese are, are uh, actually now the world's largest lender of development finance funding in the world. They're larger than they put more in than the United States does, including with the World Bank and the IM or the World Bank. Um, so that's all intended to create, uh, you know, their own zone of economic activity that uh, is totally independent of whatever the United States or, you know, if the United States and its allies, Japan, especially uh, increasingly Europe, South Korea, Australia, whatever they do, they can't, wouldn't be able to uh, uh, affect, affect them that much. So those development investments, which I think are commonly understood to be under the rubric of Belt and Road, the initiative that Xi Jinping has set up, for one, um, and I'm just positing these hypotheses, which you're welcome to, uh, to to correct, number one, must be suffering somewhat under the enormous debt burden that China's government has. So how much more money can you invest if you have enormous debt back home? Number two, if they are part of a geopolitical project to create an alternative zone to the U.S., they're not always chasing probably the wisest of investments, which is to say there must be a lot of sunk monies in, in places around the world, or or is that wrong? And then third, and this is more in the form of a question, how do we how do we counter that? Should we should we every time there's a runway built in Sri Lanka build one next to it? Or should we yeah. Uh, yeah. Should, how do we think about that? Well the the way the Chinese do development finance, I mean they um, uh, they, they will find that you know countries in Africa need roads. They need help in the mining sector. They need help in developing their um, their oil resources. And not just Africa; it's South Asia. It's increasingly Latin America. So the Chinese will will go in. They will offer financing, but they will require that the uh, the actual construction of these projects be done by Chinese companies. So they, you know, for starters, they have some of the money coming back into China. Uh, second, they, uh, a lot of it is exploitative in the sense that they need natural resources of one sort or another. They need, you know, the minerals that go into batteries. They need plenty of oil. Um, and a lot of their projects are designed specifically to capture uh, what they need, but also to dominate global markets like they've done in rare earths and in battery minerals. Um, so they're willing to do business with anyone who will do business with them, and uh, there's a high degree of corruption in uh, the uh, in because of the way they choose their business partners. They're not as concerned. They they don't need or they didn't think they needed a return on investment that Western financing uh, would always require. So as a result of all of that, <clears throat> uh, a, a large num- part of their uh, investments through the Belt and Road have proven not to be economically feasible, and they're starting to lose money. Uh, you mentioned Chinese finance. 
They, they also, because of their internal financing problem, they're unable to uh, put new money uh, to the, into these projects, either to extend bad loans or to create new ones. So, um, and all in all, right, it's increasingly clear that their BRI investments on a purely financial basis are a net negative for them. And that contributes to some of the internal problems they have. I mean, the over leverage of Chinese banks, for instance, and the, the amount of bad debt that, that's on their books. So it, it, in a way, creates an opportunity for the West to uh, sort of offer uh, counter alternatives. But we have been basically asleep, uh, asleep at the switch for 20 or 30 years. Our development finance uh, funding um, has lagged behind. Um, for instance, I mean, in, in the energy sector, now, um, under the Obama and Biden administrations, we will not support development of any fossil fuel resources anywhere in the world. So that um, – you, know, you know, I just – not to interrupt, but I just looked back at the national security strategy the other day, and there's 63 references to climate change, perhaps a dozen or more. I don't remember the exact number of references to energy security, but in the context of climate – there's not a single reference to natural gas, even though we're the world's largest exporter of it, and no mention uh, of crude oil, even though we're one of the top producers and exporters of crude oil in the world. So it really isn't viewed as as an asset in a way, as part, part of the, of the arsenal of American right. national security. That's right, and it, 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 it's a problem. That that's an you know enormous opening for the that the Chinese have exploited, uh, but it's larger than that. I mean, um, China is also trying to develop markets for manufactured goods. Um, so uh, I, I, I made the observation that we've been asleep at the switch and it's most apparent in things like um, minerals for batteries or rare earths, uh, which are dominated by the, the Chinese now. Uh, we need to find ways uh, to um, incentivize our companies and our development agencies to get back into the game. There's been rhetorical support for this at the last couple G7 meetings, for instance, something like uh, close to a trillion dollars has been pledged by the U.S. and its allies, the G7 allies, for development finance, and a large part of that is clearly intended to be an alternative find alternative projects to, um, to the Belt and Road Initiative. Is the political will there and the money there to actually make that happen? I think that remains to be seen. Um, but that's, that's a project for us going forward. So you're, so you're for essentially targeted approaches for areas that are critical to American national security, but we don't, we don't have, have to rebuild every harbor and... Uh, no, With every every runway. No, um, and w w we could be successful uh, if we uh, don't impose, you know, our own construction companies right. and try to, uh, you know, totally profit from this and make it more in the interests of developing countries to develop their own resources and to benefit from the their own resources. And that, in the long run, would have political consequences for us. For instance, as, as you know better than I, uh, you know, in the Ukraine war, the Israeli uh, the Hamas uh, attacks on uh, on Israel, votes in the United Nations are interesting because China has kind of bought its way into um, you know many many developing countries, and they they will support China in the, in, the, in, in the UN on some of these uh, uh, Im important votes about, about these uh, wars of aggression. So, so the Biden administration has issued a few uh, uh, export controls on um, uh, or put in place a few new regulations on, on investments, I should say, um, which they're proud of. I've seen statements from, for example, Chairman Gallagher, a friend of the programs, who's criticized it as not nearly enough. Can you um, tell our viewers and listeners what is CFIUS? What is reverse CFIUS? 
Are we good at it? Is it a good idea? Do we need more of it? Give us the lay of the land. Uh, CFIUS is a committee on foreign investment in the United States. Uh, It's been around for 20, 30 years. I can't remember exactly how long. It um, looks at uh, investments into the United States by foreign concerns, um, not only China or other adversaries, but um, anything that's important to the American economy, especially to national national defense or critical um, uh, technologies of the future, such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, certain forms of uh, telecommunications. So it allows a, re, uh, a look at investments to make sure they're not going to undermine national security, economic security in one sort or another. That's incoming money. We've never uh, done, done the reverse until uh, a Biden administration um, uh, executive order this summer started what's called a reverse CFIUS where we can look at uh, investments by American uh, companies by American investment houses, uh, venture capital houses that go into developing uh, ne- technologies or industries in adversary countries. I mean, especially China, but not only China. I mean, it's Russia, it's Iran, it's uh, North Korea. Um, but anyway, which would in one way or another undermine U.S. Uh, national security or leadership. So – uh, that was the Biden executive order was very narrowly targeted. Uh, semiconductors, quantum computing were explicitly mentioned. Uh, Chairman Gallagher, who you mentioned in the, his committee on the, the Chinese Communist Party, the select committee in the House, just issued a report uh, vigorously uh, supporting, and this is something I talk a, a bit about in, in my paper as well. Um, broadening the scope of external-looking investments, uh, not only in terms of uh, the industries involved, but in terms of uh, widening it to portfolio investments, i.e. American investment companies buying stocks of defense-related companies in China or uh, venture capital firms putting money into artificial intelligence uh, development in China. Uh, that sort of thing. So uh, it, it's um, uh, it's one of the uh, things that's on the horizon of uh, U.S. policy. I think going forward, it's going to be discussed and con- is being discussed in Congress on a daily basis. And I, I think we're going to see a broadening of the external related um, uh, investment screening. All right. So, uh, Tom, final question. Uh, where do you think that the Chinese economy is heading in the next five years? Do you think it's uh, it's charging towards a cliff? Do you think it's got a, a parachute attached to it? How do you think uh, – or is it going to lift off altogether if it makes the right choices? Well, it's, it's not going to lift off because uh, as long as Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party are in control, they're not going to allow the sort of private sector investment – that would allow it to uh, regain some of the dynamism of the immediate post-Mao period. Um, I guess one way I'm a little bit more um, uh, pessimistic about China is because I think uh, because of their over-leverage in their financial sector uh, and because their continued dependence on uh, dollar financing, uh, including U.S. investment and Euro um, investments, for that matter, into into China, and uh, especially uh, if we pay more attention to that and sort of exert some of the or en- en- enact some of the policies we've talked about, uh, they they could. Um, uh, they could be vulnerable to uh, an acute financial crisis, and I wouldn't totally rule out uh, that eventuality. Uh, it's impossible to predict. I mean, we can't predict. We didn't, couldn't predict the uh, real estate crisis in the in the United States. Uh, 
So uh, it's kind of a fool's errand to predict something like that, but I think there's a higher chance of some sort of a crisis in in China that would throw it into recession and uh, have serious political implications for Xi Jinping. All right, right, Tom Dusterberg, thanks for joining Counterbalance. Pleasure to be with you. Enjoyed the conversation. (laughs) 